Okay, well, in my first session, I made um, mention uh, the two witnesses' identity, and um, it's almost undisputed that Elijah, uh, or someone that comes in the spirit and power of Elijah like John, uh, to be one of them, and then Moses is the other. And um, I just want to, um, and I may, may mention to Joel's army in the book of Joel, I just want to give you... Um, the locust, the locust armies of Joel are not God's army in the sense of the redeemed saints. Um, it's, it's God using Assyria, and Babylon, the Medes and the Persians, the Greeks, to bring judgment on Israel, God's people, um, under the sovereignty. Of, it's part of one of the things is how it works under the sovereignty of God and God allowing. Things to happen in history doesn't necessarily mean that God enjoys it or he's, he's, he's out there killing the babies, so to speak. But God is allowing certain things for this. That we, we have a very independent individual way of thinking in regards to most of our theology. And we've, we don't understand how God deals with cities and nations and whole people. And God's justice for a people. And, um, and God establishing, you know, that the whole abortion issue... If, if God's judgment started falling on abortion clinics and, you know, just something happened where God's judgment fell and they suddenly dropped dead, well, oh, could God do that? Well, yeah. but the thing is, by doing that, all of these babies that are getting mass murdered, God's actually, he's making a declaration against that activity. And, and so that, that there's something bigger than this happening. And I think sometimes our, we've been limited to too much of a me theology and individual theology, not seeing bigger pictures. Um, now, in regards to the God's army in Joel, I want to read something from Joel chapter 1. It's a call to repentance, and it says, Put on sackcloth. Remember, the two witnesses come, they're wearing sackcloth. They're mourning and they're grieving over the increasing wickedness and sin of the nations. And it says... Put on sackcloth, O priests, and mourn. Wail, all you who minister before the altar. Come spend the night in sackcloth, all you who minister before my God. For the grain offerings and the drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Summon the elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. And it's summoning the priests to, to lead Joel's army. And it's an army that leads to break the power, the legal authorities that demonic powers have through, through sin. And, 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 and so there's, we are a kingdom of priests and we have a priestly ministry, the, the prophetic priesthood. And, and so the, the, the priestly ministry is the, the Joel's true army here. The only thing that can block what's coming. It goes on in Joel chapter 2. And again, this is Joel's army. Even now, declares the Lord, return your heart to me. Return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and He is compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. He relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. But blow the trumpet in Zion, declare a holy fast and call a sacred assembly. Gather the people to consecrate the, uh, the assembly. Bring together the elders, gather the children, even those nursing at the breast, and let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. And let the priests who minister before the Lord weep before the, between the temple porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn. It goes on. Those activities... See, Joel was prophetically declaring these demonic waves that were coming. And, and these demonic waves start to manifest in the judgments coming through the Assyrians and the Babylonians. As I said, there's something demonic behind all of that. But that demonic uh, attack over Israel had been empowered, uh, given legal right, because of the increasing unrepented sins and compromises of Israel. 
Um, and so the way to turn it is through these solemn sacred assemblies. Now, in history, in Joel's day, apart from possibly individual people that did listen, and individual priests that did listen, but as a whole, the nation of Israel did not listen and act upon the prophesy and the prophetic warnings of Joel. The majority of Israel did not act. They didn't call these nationwide uh, solemn assemblies. They didn't, they didn't do this thing. And for 40 years, many of them were calling Joel a false prophet because what he prophesied didn't happen. For 40 years, how dare you declare judgments over God's people? We are God's covenant people. God loves us. God would never do that to Australia, for example. Um, there was a prevailing attitude. Where is the judgment, Joel? You're a false prophet. You're, you're calling curses and judgment over God's people. He wasn't. He was warning prophetically of judgment. And if they listened to the warning, they could halt it. Now, now this is how prophetic ministry is working. Forty years later, the Assyrians come. So for 40 years, Joel may have even passed away by that time. God gave a grace season of 40 years. And in Noah's day, 120 years. The, the, the end days, the last time, the, the end times will be like the days of Noah. 120 years, he's prophesying, he's warning. Where's the rain, Noah? You've been saying this for the past 100 years. You're building your, your ship on dry ground. You're a fool. They mocked him. Um, it's interesting... There's one anointing that can devour locusts. For more than four or five hundred years of Israel's history, en masse, as a nation, no one looked at the remedy of Joel's prophecy to halt the demonization and the judgments over their nation until a man was born to a priestly family. Mm. And his name was John. Amen. And John comes in the spirit and power of Elijah. You see how this is all coming in with the two witnesses. The spirit and power of Elijah anointing. The message that came through Elijah and the message that comes through John the Baptist. John the Baptist's whole ministry was this as a prophetic priest. He called sacred assemblies. He told the nation to, to sanctify themselves. There was a baptism of repentance. And you know what Joel ate in the wilderness? Locusts. Locus. He was a demon devouring prophet. He also ate honey, which represents the honey of the word of God. He was eating the word of God and proclaiming the word of God, but he had an anointing that led, it prepared the way for the ministry of Jesus Christ himself to come. Because you don't, uh, you know, you, Jesus as the afterrunner needed a forerunner. There needs to be forerunner anointing and forerunner preparations uh, for Jesus to come in. And by the way, there's what we call major days of the Lord and minor days of the Lord. Two f major days of the Lord, first coming, second coming. Okay, But throughout history, you will see over cities and nations, minor days of the Lord in where you know, Nazi Germany, that judgment, that was pretty big, what happened in Nazi Germany. But that was a day of the Lord event where judgment came on the Nazis. And all that they'd done, very few people, especially the Jewish people, very few people go, oh no, God's terrible, look what he did to Nazi Germany. In fact, I believe the whole arising of Nazi Germany and the delusion that came over the people and that whole event is a foretype of what will happen in the end times when the Antichrist is coming. So I just wanted to make that as my first. You can start to see the relationship between, you know, and also Elijah himself in his day, he was confronting Ahab and Jezebel. Ahab and Jezebel, and uh, in the book of Revelation, we're seeing uh, the, the two witnesses are confronting the Antichrist and the false prophet, and the false prophet is leading this mother of harlots, one world religion system. Uh, by the way, John the Baptist, when he came, in the spirit of power of Elijah, he had to come against King Herod and Herodias, 
Uh, what I'm trying to say is the, the demonic spirits behind the scenes are working throughout history. They're already here. And people that would have discerned the spirit of Antichrist in Adolf Hitler were not wrong. People that have discerned the spirit of Antichrist in Mao Zedong, they were not wrong. The spirit at various places and various times of history is manifested, and the same as the spirit of the false prophet. So that's my first point uh, coming into this. In fact, the Elijah Jezebel showdown is, a, is, is, is actually a prophetic foretype of the end time showdown because we need the spirit of power of Elijah. But also we need the spirit of power of Moses because what's happening as Moses was raised up by the Lord to bring God's people out of Egypt. And remember, um, it, it says in Revelation 11, the two witnesses are going to be martyred in a city that is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt. The place where their Lord was crucified. That's, that's Jerusalem. You see, the, the abomination of the temple, when, when the Antichrist sits there, the, the abomination that causes desolation means that the, the destruction that comes from what he is doing, declaring himself as God, he makes Jerusalem the epicenter of his worldwide Antichrist kingdom. But the two witnesses arise, and the epicenter of their ministry will also be Jerusalem. This is pretty amazing. There's going to be the whole of history points back to Jerusalem. And there's going to be this major confrontation that's happening around the city. And that's why um, what's going on in Jerusalem is something to watch in history. And so we need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem at all times too. Because just as... See, God sees what God's plan is and He tries to counterfeit it. And He, and he tries to block it. And so when God has such a, an amazing end time plan for Jerusalem and the people of Israel, Satan has strategies to try to block that. That's the end time um, battle that's going on. Now I also want to make an address to another issue. Um, because of two witnesses we see and Joel's remedy to block these demonic locust hordes coming, the solemn assemblies, you know, mourning weeping, rending our hearts and not our garments, crying out to God, uh, a brokenness of spirit. But also, we're looking at the end time saints of the book of Revelation. And what are they doing? They're praising God. They're thanking God. There's joyful celebration. There's worship that has full of joy. So we're seeing these two things. When they're looking at God, who He is, and who He was, and what He's done, and what He will do, and who Christ is, and they worship Him, there's great joy in Him. There's great celebration in Him. There's great thanksgiving in Him. Even in the midst of, of, of a trial and tribulation, they can worship Him and have hope in Him. And they've got the joy of the Lord as their strength. But in regards to seeing what's going on in the world around them and the increase of sin, there's great grieving at the same time. It's not one or the other. It's both. It's both. Now, as we look at the description of the two witnesses, we see, it says, they are the two olive trees, they are the two lampstands. And that's what I want to go into in this session. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Zechariah. <coughs> Zechariah chapter 4. See, to really understand the book of Revelation, you've got to read the whole Bible. No, really. Because all the keys to understand what's being said, the types and the pictures, it actually it weaves all the way through Scripture. So in Zechariah chapter 4, starting with verse 1, Then the angel who talked with me returned and he wakened me as a man is wakened from his sleep. And I think that's that's really key wording even. The, the watchmen are the awakened ones. And you've got to be an awakened one to wake up others. And to be forerunners, you see, we go before others. 
We're preparing the way for the Lord, but we're also going before others. And, and so we've got to be the awakened one before others. And, and so the angel of the Lord comes to the prophet and wakes him up as a man who has been sleeping and slumbering. And the slumbering spirit is something that will cause you to fail to discern. And one of the reasons you slumber is you get into false comfort zones, false sense of comfort, and the enemy will do that to lull you into a sleep in the spirit. So we need to be shaken and awakened. And I believe one of God's end time purposes in allowing Hebrews 12, not just the earth, but the heavens and the earth will be shaken and everything that can be shaken will be shaken and only the unshakable kingdom which we inherit will not be shaken. So everything else will be shaken and fall away, but the unshakable kingdom will remain. And I believe the Lord is allowing shakenings to cause awakenings. But one of the keys is the forerunners are the ones that wake up first. And if you desire to be one of them, you, you give God permission. Shaken me and awaken me in the spirit. Any area of my life where I'm slumbering, I give you permission, Lord, wake me up. If I have any area of false comfort, wake me up. And I actually did a lot of research into this. I can't, I, I, we teach, I've got a network of prayer warriors throughout southeast Queensland. I teach these sort of things regularly. But I research scripture and very often when it talks about the, uh, the awakening, the watcher, the, the awakened one, it's talking about those that are slumbering, they have eyes that don't see and ears that don't hear. And I can take you through a multitude of scriptures like that because when you're spiritually slumbering, you spiritually lose your sight. You spiritually lose your hearing. You're not hearing what God is saying. You're not seeing what He's trying to show you. And, and so there's a spiritual blindness and deafness. Even And, and those scriptures, in this 1 Thessalonians, it goes through the New Testament in many places. It's talking to Christians. It's not saying, you pagan sinners out there that have never been born again, you're all you know, spiritually blind. No, it's saying to the church. And by the way... Different ways of looking and interpreting Revelation. You know, the two witnesses, they, they come in because the abomination that causes desolation is in the temple. And you can also apply the temple, that I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus flipping the tables, as Kirk's been talked about, Jesus needs to flip the tables and cleanse this temple and this temple so that this temple has authority then to start to flip the table in other people's temples. And you can even look at the church. You know, it's not just the, the, the physical temple in Jerusalem, but the church itself, there needs to be this, the two witnesses type prophetic forerunners that come through the church and start flipping the tables in the church and shaking and awakening with true prophetic words. So then the angel who talked with me returned, he wakened me as a man is wakened from his sleep. And he asked me, what do you see? One of the things about a watchman, you cannot be a watchman if you do not see. The seer anointing of the prophet is imperative for spiritual watchmen. So we need to have our spiritual eyes opened and we can ask the Lord to do this. If you're in agreement, you ask Him, waken me up in the Spirit. Open my eyes, open my ears. Lead me out of the darkness into the light. The Lord says to the prophet, what do you see? I answered, I see a, a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lights on it with seven channels to the lights. Also, there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and one on the other side. I asked the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? Like, the Lord saying, what do you see? And he describes. This is what I'm seeing in the spirit. I've got this picture. And then, and, and then he says to the Lord, what is this? There's this two-way conversation happening with God. He's seeing things, but he doesn't have the interpretation. We need to have these conversations with God as we read scripture. We need to have these conversations with God. What is this? Beast with seven heads and ten horns. What is this? The two witnesses. And have the conversations with God and start to invite Him into this seer realm. Close your eyes and try to see what Zechariah saw. Try to see what John was seeing. Try to visualize it. Then say, God, what is this? Start to give me understanding. Now I'm going to draw you a picture to give you a basic idea that what was seen. There was the lampstand. 
which is the menorah. The menorah lampstand, the seven flames of fire upon it. And I'm going to go into great detail tomorrow about the seer anointing. The seer anointing, how it's related to the seven flames of fire on the menorah. Because uh, these two witnesses were seeing things as Jesus sees things. We want to see things as Jesus sees it. And, and you know, it says Jesus, there's seven eyes that he has in, in Revelation. And his seven eyes are the seven flames of the menorah. I'll go and I'll show you all the scripture tomorrow. But Jesus doesn't just look with the eyes of mercy and read the whole Bible. Mercy, mercy, mercy. Anything that's not mercy, I don't want it. And he doesn't look with the eyes of just justice. Justice. I don't like the mercy stuff. He, he, he looks from different perspectives. So I'm going to go into that tomorrow. But Zechariah, in the vision, sees the lampstand, and then he sees these ch channels through which the oil flows, and the oil has been a little bit of a theme coming today. The wise and the foolish virgins need oil in their lamps so the fire can burn brightly. If you don't have oils in your lamp, if you don't have the oil of intimacy and the oil of the anointing of the Lord, which comes and flows through intimate relationship that you continue to walk in, that's why we intimately, we pray, we worship, we wait upon the Lord, you spend quality time with Jesus, all of these things. The oil has to flow into the, into the lampstand for the fires to burn brightly. You wonder why your fire gets snuffed out when darkness comes or crisis comes. And you know, you, the fire on your altar is gone. And, and, and the thing is, the oil of intimacy that comes through encountering Him and hearing Him and relating to Him, and, and, and then your, oil, your fire will not die. Because you've got fire and... Oh, sorry.